Hey, everybody. Uh, here we are for our Behind the Tap at the QC2 lab. I am Lucy Benedict. I'm the director of the lab here at the University of Southern Maine. Also an associate chemistry professor here. And I'm joined with my lab coordinator, Sam White. And uh, we're going to take our turn this month and show you our lab and talk about all the different things that we do. Um, so our webinar rundown, as we always start off, we're going to have 45-ish minutes of a tour um, and then Q&A at the end. But feel free anytime to ask questions. You can use the chat if you'd like, but um, Q&A is probably the best place to do it. Um, that's somewhere on your screen, depending what device you're using. And uh, you can raise your hand. Um, I might not see you in the participant list if we're talking, but um, I'll try to um, scope that out once in a while while we go through this. Um, yeah, that's our webinar rundown. And so let's get started. Here we go, the history of the QC2 lab. So today, um, our webinar, we're going to go through the history. We're going to talk about the structure. And then um, we're going to really show you kind of the pieces that are key elements to our lab. And then we're going to round that all out by talking about the research, some of the research projects that we've done and that we have going on in the lab right now. So the history of the QC2 lab, how do we get all this started? It's definitely different than the other labs that you might have toured with us in our Behind the Tap series. Um, we're at a university, so that automatically makes us different. We're not in a brewery. Um, but we started this whole project in 2014, or about there. Um, this whole crazy idea came about when I took my instrumental analysis students, which are 300 level, uh, it's a 300 level course. It's a laboratory course that really focuses on teaching students how to use the instrumentation in our labs um, and teaching them the methods behind them, how they work, um, and then letting them apply them to different types of samples. So for instance, we use gas chromatography a lot in that um, course and students can pick different uh, methods they might like to try with a gas chromatograph. So that course can be very cookbooky. So if you think back to the chemistry or science labs that you might have had when you were in high school or chemistry, they probably had a little bit of just follow the directions, very much like a recipe, a cookbook, right? Um, that doesn't really engage students as well as giving them real world experience. So um, I decided to take my students on tours of different places in the Portland, Maine area that had um, laboratories that utilize different um, instrumentation that we might see in our lab and had scientists from the area um, who were doing really cool things. We got to see Texas Instruments, we went to Barber Foods, we saw a lot of different places. But one of the places along the way that we stopped was Allagash um, Brewery. And this was a while back, it was when they had a much smaller lab. Um, but Zach Boda, who is three, behind the taps ago, um, let us come into the lab there. And during the tour, we got talking about all the things that they wished that they could measure in their lab, but they didn't have at that time, especially the tools to do that. So we talked about measuring chlorine, chloride and fluoride. We talked about um, volatile analysis, a lot of different things that we have the tools for that I was looking for experience for my students to do. Um, and so we started a class project that semester. My students were super psyched um, because they met somebody else besides me and their professors who was really excited about science. And they got right to work on this project that could help a local brewery understand their beer better. So that project went amazingly well. I kind of integrated it into a couple other courses I was teaching. And in 2015, um, there was a lot going on in the university at that time. Um, one of the things was reaching out more and more to the community. Uh, we ended up having a conversation with a few other breweries, Rising Tide Foundation, um, and a couple other local breweries. And the same conversation happened that I had with Zach at Allagash. We need tools. Um, we need access to um, people who know how to use these tools, understand our beer better, um, even things as simple to us as spectrophotometers, which we have a ton of in our laboratory, um, you know, they're not accessible to, uh, to all breweries. So 
we partnered up, ganged up with the, the main Brewers Guild and um, some other local folks and got a grant proposal put together. Um, first has started out really small, started out, started out about $40,000. And then um, our granting association said to me, well, if you dreamt big, really big, got everything you wanted, how much would that come up with? So $500,000 later um, and three years worth of funding got us to launch the QC2 lab in 2016. And that is what we are today. This is a main um, economic improvement funded um, facility right now. We opened in 2016, the same time that the, um, the beer brew summit open for the guild um, up here in New England. And we've been going ever since. It's been really exciting to see the lab grow. Um, the funding that we first got helped us purchase things like an alkalizer, which you'll see a little bit later in our lab, um, to get a new gas chromatograph with some special little bells and whistles other than the one we had and a few other pieces to add in. Um, and from there, we've really been able to build every year um, our students, because they're the key piece of it. The, the lab is, is run as much as possible by our undergraduates who are um, chemistry majors, biology majors, biochemistry majors. Um, every year we have a group of anywhere from two students during COVID um, at times to upwards of six to seven students like you see there in the picture in the middle. Um, we can have a really big group. Those students participate in testing. Um, they, we try to have them do all of the testing um, that brewers do, which Sam's going to talk about the structure in just a little bit. So you can really get a feel for all of those pieces of the lab that we talk about. There's students that are integrated into all of those. So it really gives this unique educational perspective for students, which was my main goal um, to give them a place, a place to work that is supportive, that helps build their education before we send them off um, to grad schools and to um, careers. And so that was the, the, the goals, the mission, the, the thoughts around building this lab. Come to now, 2020, which was a crazy year as we all know, in 2021, which is right now, um, we've really done a lot. Um, if you knew us back when we opened and you know us now, we look very different. We have a logo um, that I'm wearing on my shirt right now. Um, we have a whole new look. We have a website. Um, we have a business plan. We're really moving forward in that direction. Um, and the cool thing about all of that, the videos that you see, um, the, the marketing that we've done, the business plan, has all had students integrated into it as well. So being at a university, there's so many resources, right, that we can rely on that we've really tried to leverage. Um, another thing you'll see coming up for our lab, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in the future piece, are internships. Um, so we'll build upon the lab. So there's more to come. We've grown a lot. Um, and that's kind of the history of the lab. Now I'm going to pass the mic over to Sam and let her really explain to you what the structure of the lab is and how we work. Hey, Sam, you're muted. Good, no, goodness gracious. <laughs> Hi. Um, all right, so there's kind of three prongs to the lab, if you will. We have our fee-for-service work, then our educational programming, and our research. So I'll start with fee-for-service, because that's how most brewers come to know the lab. So as Lucy said, we have a lot of instrumentation and experience that are hard to have in house in a brewery. So most brewers that use our services will order through our website. This is just a cute little screenshot from our website. We have analytical testing services and molecular testing services um, and microbial. Um, and the tests are all run as much as possible by undergraduate students. So this is Cass, one of the students that is currently in our lab. And they come into our program. We have a really rigorous training program where it's based on a I do, we do, you do model of education. So it takes quite a bit of time before students are signed off on tests, but at that point they really know the material inside and out and 
are able to perform the tests um, pretty autonomously, which is a huge accomplishment for our undergraduates. Um, because often, you know, you have these like CAM labs where you're not able to do problem solving um, as freely and um, it's just an awesome opportunity. So in addition to fee for service, we also do educational programming and research. I'll let Lucy talk about the research a little bit later, but education is really um, in two different methods. So we have the education of undergraduates. Uh, this is another student that worked in our lab this fall. Um, her name is also Sam. So uh, she's great. Sam's a great. Um, and you, the students really do learn a lot while they're working in our lab and they get real world experience that makes them very competitive for graduate programs and also in the job market wherever their career might take them. We also offer educational programming for the larger craft beverage industry. So this is again from our website. You can go and check out all of the past events that we've had before to kind of see what we offer. But just in the last two months, we've had a webinar that was focused on general yeast methods in the brewery with the demonstration of cell counting. And we did a um, building your QC2 lab, which was focused more for brewers that are just starting to launch their QC program. And then we also always try to have these um, free opportunities to connect the brewing community and for us to connect with you guys and vice versa. Um, and also give people the opportunity to see what other brewers are doing because brewing science is super interesting and um, well, we obviously really love it. So that's kind of the structure of the lab and the way that we work. Um, right now, of course, things are a little bit um, different. So we have brewers either dropping off samples directly to the lab or shipping them. And historically, a brewer would just come right up to the lab and we'd get to meet them. But right now it's all kind of a hands or a contactless uh, system. So we're really looking forward to being able to have brewers come back in here, show, show you in person what the lab is all about. But that's a really you know, quick brief overview of the lab. And now I think we're gonna hand it back over to Lucy so she can introduce you to all of the analytical services that we offer. Okay, so I am going to um, just share my screen real quickly with you um, and show you a pre-recorded video because I've watched everybody try to finagle their computers and since only one person can be in the lab at the time, um, I've got a video here um, that I'm just going to kind of scroll through what we've got in the lab um, for analytical tools that we use um, on a regular basis. Um, the spectrophotometer, I think in every lab that we've seen, and I know that um, out there, Jeremy and Spencer are, are listening probably right now. Or, <laughs> um, so if you didn't have one, um, let me know that I'm wrong. But I think every lab has had a spectrophotometer that we've, we've gone on a tour with. These are like a key piece of instrumentation. They're, um, first of all, an amazing educational tool because they do so many different things. Um, but they also are an amazing tool for um, beer analysis because there's a lot of different methods that have been developed that you can use. Um, there are methods, uh, we use them for color, IBU, um, protein. You can use them for SO2 um, analysis, which we're working on a method um, for that right now, but based off the ASBC method, just, just cutting down a bit of the, the chemical usage on that. Um, it's a really robust instrument. Um, you can also do VDKs with it. There is a method out there for that. I haven't had a lot of luck with that method. Um, we ended up using gas chromatography for that, but another tool you can use it for, but another, a great instrument to have. Um, this one has got a, a few more bells and whistles than, um, you need to have, um, but 
you know, it, you could get a much smaller one. Um, I will say the one thing about ours that I really do love, and it sounds like a silly little thing, but um, Thermo has a program that's developed that makes it really easy for running beer analysis, um, where when you pull up the main menu screen, you really pick um, the analysis that you want to do, and it does all the calculations for you. So really a, a nice user-friendly um, piece of instrumentation that's really good for our first, um, our students who are incoming to the lab because for them, they use the spectrophotometer in their general chemistry labs um, in a few different ways. So it's nothing that's new to them. It's just a new application. So this one's really cool. This one also, if I want to geek out for a second, has a double beam. So you can actually put a second cuvette in there. Um, and measure them against each other. So if you want to test kinetics and how rates change over time based off a reference, you can do that. And that's, that's pretty awesome. But anyway, that's not necessary. Um, so that's our spectrophotometer. I'm gonna wander over in a second. Um, we kind of have this whole area set up for color and then also for IBU. We have our centrifuge here that has a lot of different uses, but is needed for IBU. Um, the other thing that we have that we didn't have in the beginning and, and our original student who um, in the history, he was the, the first pitcher um, up there, Ryan, and, and I realized is that if you're doing IVU, you really need a mechanical shaker. Um, if you don't have one, trying to shake um, your IBU samples so that you get reproducible results is really, really hard. Um, and you've got to shake for a really long time. So getting your hands on one of these, you can usually buy them used um, at different lab stores um, online, um, is really awesome and saves you a bunch of time and arm muscle um, and gives you much better results. So if you are shaking by hand and you're getting um, results that aren't super reproducible, that could definitely be one of the challenges. Um, so I wish, just wish we had more spots on our shaker for other samples. Now we're getting into my favorite part of our entire lab. Um, and this is the chromatography section. We actually have two gas chromatographs um, in the lab. Um, and to be honest, we really need um, both of them. Um, there's just not enough of me to run them both all the time. But this one that you see here is the new one that we got. Um, and this one is, is really our workhorse. This is the one that I use um, to do diacetyl analysis, VDKs. Um, we have an electron capture detector on there um, with a column that goes directly to that. So we have two injection ports on it. Um, and then we have another injection port with a column that goes directly to the mass spec. Um, which we use for right now for dimethyl sulfide analysis and all of all of the other volatiles that we look for. Um, right now we can do um, probably about, I, I think a, a little over a dozen different volatiles on this instrumentation. Um, gas chromatography, any chromatography is really useful too. And one of the reasons it's so useful is that for chromatography, what you're doing is you're separating out the compounds in your sample so that you can analyze them each individually as they come off of a column. Um, I'll show you the, what a column looks like in a second. One thing that this instrument has that's really nice is it has headspace analysis. Um, so up here you would have some larger vials and you can, instead of drawing liquid out of those of the range, you draw the gas out of there and inject the gas. So any of those compounds that are volatile will go into the gas phase and then you can directly take those and inject them into your um, gas chromatograph. Our other GC, um, so this one has gas um, headspace and liquid injection. Our other one is, is only liquid. Um, it's tricky because in chrom gas chromatography, you can't really inject um, water, right? There's a whole lot of water. So you either have, you have to find some way to extract those compounds out that you want to analyze. Um, and to do this, um, the my favorite way is to use solid phase micro extraction, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more when we get into the research piece of it. But I'm going to give you an inside view of this chromatograph because um, gas chromatography is really cool. Um, there is your injection port. Um, the other instrument looks a little bit different, but essentially the same. Your needle would go right into that little hole um, there. You'd inject your sample in. And then if we look inside, you can see where your sample goes. So I'm gonna pop this little one open. 
Um, and you can see right there, um, that's the column, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but as I look up here, you can see right here, this is right below that injection port. So I'll show you up again, there's the injection port. Um, and when you inject your sample, it goes right down into there. Um, and then in through this coil, um, and that's the column. The column is amazing. That's 60 meters in there of glass tubing that's coated with, um, each column has a different coating. You can see on here, it says TG um, 624 uh, sil MS. So that's a special column. Um, shout out to Spencer over at Creature Comforts for cluing me into this awesome column. Um, this is a great column for VDK, or not for VDKs, for volatile separation. Um, and so it's 60 meters of a column that is microns thick um, and your gas is pumped through there and allowed to separate. So it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. You can get a lot of separation. You can separate out hundreds of compounds onto there. And then it goes over to our mass spec, which is the detector on that instrument. Um, we have other chromatography in our lab as well. We have liquid chromatography, um, which will give you a little view of there. Um, our liquid chromatograph here is pretty neat. It can do sugars um, and it can do acids. And those are the two things we mainly look at with this one. Um, gas chromatography is great for anything you can turn into a gas. Liquid chromatography we utilize for separating out anything that doesn't want to go into that volatile phase or we can't force into that volatile phase. Um, liquid chromatography, because you're forcing a liquid through here, your column is a lot different. Um, it's a lot shorter, thicker, um, but you get that same separation based on the stuff basically that's inside of the column and the type of liquid you're forcing through it. Um, it helps separate out the compounds like those sugars. We can look at glucose, maltose, um, maltotriose, fructose, uh, a whole bunch of different sugars we can separate out using um, our RI detector right there. There's also a UV detector in here, which is really great for looking at different types of acids um, and isoalpha acids. So we have that set up, um, which we hope to use more this summer um, and we've used for a couple of our research projects. Another really cool instrument, they're all cool, right? But um, that we have here is an AA. Um, this is a flame um, AA, atomic absorption spectrophotometer. We use this for calcium, magnesium, and zinc analysis. Um, so we've got that going on in our lab. And then last but not least, the workhorse of many labs, um, our alkalizer, which um, We've seen in a couple other labs, but this is great for um, getting really um, accurate, specific densities, um, ABV calculations, calories, um, and that kind of thing. Some other types of uh, analyses we do in the analytical side of the lab, we've um, started moving into doing some nutritional analysis, carbohydrates, um, calories that have been ASH corrected, and that kind of thing. So. There's a lot of different methods that we can do um, and that we focus on in the analytical lab and train our students to do. So um, that's the analytical side. I'm gonna pass the mic over to Sam and she can show you the micro side. All right, awesome. So moving on to micro. The micro side of the lab is a little bit smaller than the impressive instrument bay that uh, Lucy has, but we still get a lot done. So um, it's really just one bench, the bench that you can see behind me here. And most of the magic for molecular, it's not magic, it's science, um, for molecular and microbial work actually happens right here, just at the bench top. It doesn't maybe look that impressive, but my kind of joke with um, molecular and micro work is that it's a lot of pipetting clear liquids into clear liquids, and it's really tiny amounts of each liquid. So here on the bench shop, I actually have a ELISA that I ran. So that's enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. And we use that to determine the parts per million of gluten in a beer sample. So, and we're actually also using it for seltzers as more and more breweries are starting to 
brew seltzers in house, they want to be able to ensure their consumers that there's no cross contamination um, because it's a it's a shared facility. Probably the most often used instrument on my side of the lab are the um, uh, variable volume pipettes. I don't know how I'd live without them. Uh, I'll talk about this in a little bit. But the impressive instruments that we have are first and foremost our microscope. So this is a um, very powerful microscope. It's the Olympus BX50. Um, it's right behind me, although it's got its dust jacket on, so it doesn't look quite as fancy. Um, but you know, any microbial work that we're doing that involves plating, of course, we need to be able to visualize those microbes. Mostly this is used for research at this point. We don't really do too much um, plating for fee-for-service work right now, but we are using this to validate a or to beta test an instrument that I'll talk about in a second. Um, one thing that I really love about this microscope, and if you're in the market for a microscope, I would highly recommend that you consider this as well, is it has a camera at the top of it above the oculars here. And that's really nice because it allows us to take images of any uh, microbe that we might be looking at, or in the case of research, it allows us to really thoroughly document um, what we've what we've been doing. So it's valuable because then we can go back and, you know, this microscope is like a $10,000 microscope. It's way overkill for what you need in a brewery um, for the most part. Although if you want to buy a $10,000 microscope, I'm sure nobody will stop you from it. Um, but I would recommend making sure that you can expand it and attach a, um, a camera eventually because it's really valuable for institutional knowledge. Also, if you have um, someone in the brewery that's been managing your QC program leave, you know, they leave with all of that information um, and experience and it's really valuable to be able to hand it off to the next person and say, oh, hey, I think we've seen that before um, and have that documented. So I love this microscope. It's really nice. Uh, so the next big thing that we do, I loved it so much. I really focused on it. <laughs> um, the next thing that we do on the microbial side is polymerase chain reaction work. So there's two instruments here, this shorter, smaller one is a thermal cycler. So it basically just modulates temperature. And what it allows us to do is utilize PCR technology. So that is taking um, a sample of DNA and amplifying it. So often if you are testing your beer, you only have um, so much DNA and it's not enough to be detectable. So you need to amplify it for many, many cycles in order to be able to say, yes, it's theirs, no, it's not. So this is a mostly qualitative instrument where we are able to take the samples from the thermal cycle cycler and run them on an agarose gel, which separates the samples by size. And then we can determine if the microbe that we're interested in is present in the sample. Now next to it, the much more beefed up looking instrument, this is a Quant Studio 5, it's from uh, Applied Biosciences by Thermo, and it is a qualitative PCR. So that's using fluorescence of intercalating dyes in the DNA that's being amplified um, that allows us to have a number that we can put onto the information. So it's not just that it's there, we can also say what its um, relative abundance is. So uh, this program, um, our qPCR program, is something that we are really working to develop and uh, an area that we hope to expand and spend a lot of time on this summer. So the other instrument that's actually not on, um, not on this video, I'm realizing, is 
right behind me. It's a little black box. It doesn't look that impressive, but it's very, very cool. Um, it's part of a beta testing program that we're working on with a local company called Spego Scientific. And it's their AIM-10, which is a liquid particle analyzer. And we are currently doing a project where we're um, testing its ability to look at yeast viability. Um, so that's really, really exciting. And I think that's all I've got for the molecular and the micro side. So I'll kick it back over to Lucy so she can talk about research. Research in our lab. Um, first, one of the things I want to highlight with research. So we have had dozens of projects in our lab and, and they can range from anywhere from kind of small questions that brewers have about their beer where we're just kind of tracking um, to a, a much larger, much larger pictures um, for um, issues that are going on in the brewery or new methods that are developed. And I'll show you a couple of research projects that we've done, but um, Pre-COVID, um, all of the research that we did, um, our students were a part of and we would present them at the American Chemical Society National Meeting and these are pictures of our students. Um, one thing about our students is the USM has a very diverse population of students, which makes it really, really fun to teach here um, and give students opportunities they really um, never imagined were there. Um, and many of our students also haven't traveled much. So all of these conferences are in different parts of the US. We have been to, um, oh, we've been to San Francisco, which is the, the picture to your left with the, the guy in the middle, Jacob pointing to the two posters. Um, below the two gentlemen who are standing here, I'll talk about in a second. Um, there's Jordan and Jacob presenting to um, other scientists. There are over 15,000 chemists that go to this American Chemical Society conference and thousands of posters are presented um, and people are really excited to see what we're doing. So that's really fun. Um, the two gentlemen up there on the, the top right, uh, they're both named Nick, which is really funny um, to be traveling with the two of them together. They presented in New Orleans um, in 2018 and their research. So um, that was really cool. Um, so they get this experience to present. We get to share this um, work with the public. Um, going to the next slide is a great example of the research that we have. Um, THP is a question that's come up a few times um, in different presentations. So I thought I would highlight that. Um, Lisa Kraut was one of our students um, who worked on this with myself and our organic chemist, Mike Hausman and Zach Boda over at Alec Ashbury. Um, and I'm going to share my screen so I can show you um, her poster in a little bit more detail. So Lisa and, and I got working on um, this project sounded super easy looking at um, some tetrahydropyridines in beer. Um, they, they should be easy to analyze looking at their structure. Um, you can taste them uh, so you know that they're there. And so we tackled this project when Zach gave it to us. We're like, okay, we got it. You know, like GC mass spec should be able to pick this, this compound up. Um, and all we have to do is, is go out and buy a standard, couple standards of the compounds that we think it might be. You know, there's three different compounds of THP that it's very likely um, one of them, if not a, a couple, create this mousy, I call it Dorito bomb type flavor um, in beer. And, and there's, um, it's not all beer, it's in, in wild beers, uh, definitely with um, Brettomyces, um, potentially with also a lacto, um, peaches work their way into there in some fun way. But there's a lot of questions out there about, about this in beer and there's not a lot of research. So first thing we did, we go to look for a standard <laughs> There's no standards. Um, they're very expensive if you can find them. Um, you know, so we had a problem there. There's very few people who are making this compound. So first thing we had to do instead of buy standards was synthesize the major compound that's likely to be um, causing this flavor compound. So we did. We um, synthesized one of the two, one of the three compounds. Um, which is six acetyl, one, two, three, four tetrahydropyridine. Um, 
it looks like this. It's a nice, easy synthesis. Um, it doesn't give us a high yield, um, which means that in this, there's a very low amount of um, the ATHP, but there's enough in there definitely to be able to detect it via gas chromatography. Um, and that gives us our first clue in here of what to do next. We spiked beer with our synthesized compounds and we worked on extraction methods. Um, the common way to uh, get this out of beer to analyze it is what they call a continuous liquid liquid extraction, which I started after we presented this paper. Um, and that is one way to extract it. We tried some simpler extraction methods similar to what you would do with IBUs, um, which gave us um, detection of the compound, but at such high probability concentrations that uh, much higher than what we would find in beer. So one of the projects we now have that we're um, continually working on in the lab is, is trying to find ways um, while we can extract it from a sample that is spiked with a known um, compound of ATHP, we can't, um, we have yet to be able to extract um, any THP compounds from beer that you can taste it in. Um, and so that's the next step. Can we take, can we find a method where we can, you know, replicate it in the spike sample with a beer that we know has it in there? Um, so that's been a trick for us um, and one of the many research projects we have going on. Another project that we have going on um, that I want to share with you is um, a project we did a little while back that gives you a really good example of um, how we work on creating new methods. Um, and there'll be one more example after this. So zinc analysis we can do by flame AA. And um, we started this project like we do with, we did with calcium magnesium. We started following the ASBC method. Um, and one of the differences between zinc um, analysis and calcium magnesium is that in flame AA, you introduce your sample directly to a flame. Um, and when that sample get, goes into the flame, when it's sprayed into the flame, um, the compounds that are in there break apart, they atomize, and you can measure different elements based on how they absorb light. In calcium and magnesium in beer, we dilute the beer quite a bit before we introduce it to the flame. In the zinc method, there's no dilution. You just introduce your sample directly to the flame. And if you can think about putting beer into a flame, especially war into a flame, with those sugars, they caramelize on the flame and out goes your, your flame and you're, you end up spending half a day cleaning your instrument out. So that was a trick. Um, there's a few ways around that, but they decrease your reproducibility with the instrument. And so we wanted to find a way where we could keep our reproducibility, we could um, get the response that we're looking for um, and keep that flame going and not um, crystallize sugars on it or caramelize sugars on it. So the student and I worked on this method and what we did was we chemically digested the beer. Um, and essentially what you're doing is you're exposing beer to um, concentrated hydrogen peroxide, that's about 10%, which is, is pretty, um, pretty reactive, and then also concentrated nitric acid, and you boil it. So you're really breaking down the sugars in the beer um, when ideally not touching anything about the zinc. Um, and so we did this. It also helps keep it from adhering to the glass and that kind of thing. So we, we did this with our zinc. We boiled it down. We did um, spiked samples, so samples that we knew had um, the concentration of zinc in it. We did it with unspiked samples. Um, we ran just water through this method to make sure we'd get our recovery. Um, and we ended up getting a really nice um, comparison of zinc and being able to digest these samples down. So one of the things within our research that we are constantly trying to do is create new methods um, or modify methods like um, SO2 analysis where we can reduce the chemical usage, we can make them greener, or we can make them more reproducible, um, increase the detection limit so that we can detect at lower concentrations is definitely a focus of our research. Um, and Sam, if you could bring up the PowerPoint again, um, one last really cool research project that we have going on 
that was funded by the American um, Society of Brewing Chemists, the ASBC, which is a great resource, um, is the analysis of dimethyl sulfide in beer and wort. So um, dimethyl sulfide in, in beer and wort is done right now by gas chromatography. Um, ideally, you have a separate detector on there, a flame photometric detector or something similar that is very specific to looking at sulfur compounds. You can also use mass spec, which is what we do in our lab, um, but it's tricky. DMS is, is not an easy um, compound to analyze by chromatography. And so one of the things that we're trying to do with working with our engineering department is build a device that can quantify, can measure the amount of DMS in beer and wort. Um, that is much simpler to use than chromatography, doesn't need the expensive um, instrumentation. And this all is based off of a paper I read when I was at home during COVID and lab was closed. Um, there are several papers actually out, but this was the one that really, um, we're really building the device off of um, that measure dimethyl sulfide in seawater. Um, because when you're on a ship, um, dimethyl sulfide obviously is volatile, you need to be able to uh, measure it right away or be able to preserve your samples, which is very hard. So a couple of groups have created these portable devices that you can bring right onto a ship um, and be able to measure dimethyl sulfide with. And the way they do this is they put a sample in a tube like this, they bubble air into that tube, that air drives the gas up, the DMS vapor up, that DMS is um, exposed to ozone and that reaction between DMS and ozone is chemiluminescent. It gives off light. If we can measure the light that's given off during that reaction, then we can tell how much DMS is in that sample and quantify it pretty easily. We're gonna take that same, we are taking that same idea. Um, and instead of having the water sample in here, we're gonna put beer in there. We're gonna put wort in there. Um, and we're going to, try to see if this works in the same way that it does for seawater. The levels that they were measuring it in seawater are much lower. So um, the levels that we expose that we have in, in beer um, are higher than that. So hopefully um, this will all work. Some of the concerns that I have is definitely the carbonation in beer is going to change um, this flow of gas. Um, and then also are there any other compounds in there that might chemiluminesce? and give off light at the same wavelength. It's very unlikely, but it definitely is something that we need to be able to look at. So engineering is building this device for us right now. We hope in the early summer, late spring to start testing it very soon um, to be able to see if it really does work with beer. So that's really exciting. So those are some of the research projects. Another one that I don't have a slide of, but that I wanted to talk about real quick as an example is um, a project that we're working on directly with a brewery and that's with Jack's Abbey. Um, we're looking at the volatile profiles of beers that are carbonated in different, in lagers that are carbonated in different ways um, to see if that changes the flavor profile. Um, and that's a really, really cool example of how research can directly support um, understanding more in the beer than um, kind of some of these other projects that are very internal to our lab. Awesome. Yeah. So um, I just want to bring it back to the students. So all of the projects that Lucy just mentioned, you know, students are engaged actively in them. Students run our fee for service work. They are really the foundation of our lab. Um, this is just some of the students that have worked in our lab just in the last year alone. And um, I don't want to spoil anything in the future direction, but um, we're definitely going to have even more students that will be able to participate in the lab and enrich the brewing community as we move forward into the future. I want to go back just to the students real quick. I think um, one of the things I want to say about our students that um, is really interesting that I think um, 
people don't realize is that a, a lot of people assume that our students go on to work in breweries at quality control labs. And one of the really cool things about working in the lab with all of the instrumentation and these different methods is that they are so transferable to so many other fields. Our students go to graduate school. Um, Sierra, who you saw in one of the pictures previously in a poster is at Penn State right now, finishing up her PhD. Our students have gone to work for Katahdin Labs, um, Alir, um, they're they're all over the place here in Maine, and that's in and at breweries too. I you know don't get me wrong, but I think that's a really neat thing is is how transferable the skills are that they learn. Um, so the experience that they get is just forwarding their careers, um, which is really neat. But moving on into the future, a um, couple of things that we have coming up, um, probably the top one that I'm most excited for is this summer we are piloting an internship program where we will have students working directly in QC labs at breweries. Um, and as we develop this program this summer, we'll be starting with two, but we hope next summer to have um, many more students working um, around the state of Maine and, and maybe further if possible to help support um, quality control in breweries. Um, that's probably the most exciting thing I have for our future. We also will have um, a summer workshop series that we're hoping to open up in June, which we're still trying to figure out all the COVID things, but once we do, um, we'll be putting that out there. But um, yeah, those are the, the future things I was thinking about. I don't know if Sam got anything else to add to that. Um, yeah, the only thing I would add is there's a good picture here um, of the instrument that we're beta testing. So this is the man wearing a red shirt here is Mike. He's the inventor. And so that's a really exciting um, thing for our students to be able to participate in and for the lab to be able to participate in. And I think Mike's pretty psyched on it too. That's about, that's all I had to add. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, that's really exciting with Sebago Technics. Really fun. Um, yeah, I guess that's that's what we've got. Uh, any questions out there, please feel free to throw them at us. Um, I could create my own questions for myself. That might be weird. Um, but yeah, we'll just hang out here if people have questions and go from there. If nobody has questions, it was really cool having everybody um, on here and being able to share the lab. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. Um, and our next Behind the Tap is coming up in the end of May, and that'll be at Jackie O's. Um, and that'll be really cool. We'll be going from Athens, Georgia, where we were last month, to next month, Athens, Ohio. So hope you can join us for that. We got a thanks. That was great. Ooh, we have a question. Any thoughts on using solid phase extraction for the THP? That is a direct to Lucy question. Yeah, that's a good question. So I've used solid phase micro extraction for THP um, with our spike samples and had had great success with it. And then I tried it on some samples that clearly tasted um, like THP and found nothing. Um, so, you know, a couple of ideas that I had from moving forward with that is to try to, we, I had a couple of different fibers with different coatings on them. So trying new ones, um, and maybe going down that route, but yeah, there was nothing on the, on the, the fiber from the solid phase extraction that we did. So that was a bummer. 
Um, but when it was spiked, it was there. So definitely was picking it up. It might also be messing around with some of the um, some of the parameters there. So yeah, that's a great idea. Um, maybe in the future it'll work out. Mm. Yeah, so Kevin said this would be liquid pass through. I have not tried solid phase extraction um, columns with it. I did find, um, we did try some, some extraction columns with silica and alumina um, and didn't get any luck with them, but you could try and I definitely like a, an SBE column with different material might be worth giving it a go. Um, and Spencer is asking, have you found, have you delved into optimization of different fibers for different target compounds on the mass spec at all? So I found that, um, oh my gosh, what is it? It's a, it's a DVB car, um, polyvinyl something column, the, the fiber with three different um, coatings on it. That's um, a pretty standard fiber, does a great job of extracting many of the different compounds. Um, I've even had luck with it with DMS um, in the past, which is something I really wanna focus on more. Um, but I haven't, I haven't gone too much further than that column, um, that type of fiber because it's given such good results. But it is really nice. You get, um, I find that using solid phase micro extraction um, instead of the headspace injection gives me um, some better peaks. Um, so you're getting a little bit better response um, and some more sensitivity from some of those compounds that tend to um, get lost in the headspace analysis, you start to see them pop up a little bit better with solid phase micro extraction. My only down, the only downfall of solid phase micro extraction is it takes much longer to get through samples. Yeah, Kevin, that's a good idea. We can, um, and I exchange polymer based SPE solid phase extraction should work. Um, that definitely would be something to try. Um, might light, light my fire again to look at THP, which is, would be fun to do. So yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. Um, there's so many different avenues to give a try with this. We have to have a talk sometime, just a webinar about THP where we have everybody just come on, share their ideas. I think that would be fun. All right, well, Sam and I'll hang out here for a little bit longer to answer any other questions that people have. And um, yeah, thank you everybody for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for checking out the lab. Spencer wants to know where our party lights are. Uh, <laughs> you don't think overhead fluorescence is party enough? Oh, uh, yeah. You know, I tried to steal my kids' um, LED lights from their walls, and they were not happy about it. So not yet. 